Hello, everybody. My name is Tina Colangelo. Hope everybody's well. Thank you for attending this webinar. It is on how to succeed in macro, a guide in macro readiness that no one else is talking about. I will guarantee you nobody else is talking about this. And this is the one thing we all need to be talking about in order to um, get that macro success and to understand the macro education. So I'm going to teach you this by showing you just how big macro is so you can get a deeper understanding that a shift in the mindset in this new paradigm will get you the money you want. It's a shift in mindset and then something cool as well. So hi, my name is Tina Colangelo and I am known as the one go-to consultant for incentives in the healthcare industry. I'm very proud of that title and I have a very big drive to get physicians the money that they deserve. Um, I've gotten a lot of my physicians hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on the Medicare Advantage uh, side, and I am super excited to do the same thing for you with MACRA. There's even a lot more money to be made with MACRA, so um, I will keep my title and you will be very happy. I'm also the creator of the MACRA Readiness Viewpoint, which we will discuss throughout this webinar. And for the past 18 months, I have devoted my focus to macro education. And in that time, I've developed strategies on how your practice can successful, um, be successful in this new paradigm called macro. I've immersed myself into the almost 2,400 page law. So you don't have to. So you can continue to take care of your patients, which by the way, patient engagement, is of course at the center of macro. I have macro coming out of my ears. I have macro in my blood. Um, this law is very exciting. There's so much promise and opportunity and I will show you all of that today. So here's what we'll learn during this presentation. We're gonna learn just how massive the concept is so that you can truly understand macro. We are going to learn how to shift your mindset without spending enormous amounts of time on macro education and research so you can continue to take care of your patients. So it's just how massive the concept is, a shift in your mindset, just an open mind, and then how to avoid that 4% penalty and also get you the money that you want. But the new way to attack macro is just a change in mindset. That's, that's all it is. It's a change in mindset. Yes, you're going to need the education. Yes, you're going to need every, every other, all the other materials, but most of all the training approaches we've learned is dead wrong because it's too much information at one time. It becomes overwhelming and unproductive. The audience walks away with the ideology that macro is over my head. It's not over yet. It's just too much information. I just said I studied it for 18 months. Uh, I'm asking you to learn it in an hour. That's, I mean, come on. That's not even fair. I can help you with understanding the magnitude of macro and the impact it has on the healthcare industry. And I can help you develop a strategy so that you can be confident in your approach and start submitting your data on January 1st, 2017. I can help you. Think about macro the right way so that you can get the macro money you want and position yourself ahead of the competition. This is a national competition. This is a national competition. So you're going to want to be ahead of the curve. So is this webinar for you? If you're concerned about macro but don't know how to understand it and you want to succeed, this webinar is for you. If you're an independent practice and want to stay that way, this is for you. If you want to get that exceptional bonus from the $500 million pot, this is for you. If you want to be successful, this is for you. If you want to understand macro and implement it into your practice or organization, this is for you. If you are overwhelmed with other job responsibilities and you need to understand macro law, this is for you. If you're worried about getting a 4% penalty because you're not prepared for macro, this is for you because you're going to discover your macro strategy. So there are some house rules before I go into my um, webinar. I don't want to hear 
any defeatist attitudes. That's, I just want to pay the macro penalty. I never get ahead. I'm in an ACL. They'll take care of it. I will just catch up later. My office manager will take care of it. It's an unfair program. I'm looking at all these penalties. I don't want to hear any of that. None of that mentality is allowed in this webinar. Only an open mind and new eyes for opportunity is allowed. I don't want to hear this minimum reporting mentality. Unless you're retiring this year, it's it's not allowed. It's not allowed on this webinar. Minim, minimum reporting is not going to get you anywhere but more penalties. And that is exactly what we're trying to avoid. We're going to go for the gusto here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to change our mindset. We're going to have an open mind. We're going to make the necessary office changes. And then we're going to get that $500 million. I'm telling you it's possible. New opportunities. Before I go any further, I just want to let you know that this industry ha will continue to be rich with opportunities as we together, we carry on this transformation. It's not the politicians. It's not anybody else. It's you, me, it's us. We will be the ones to take advantage of the opportunities. So don't believe all the negative stuff that you hear because I've heard a lot and it's not none of that is true it just it's, it's a completely different playing field yes I know this may sound unattainable but just listen I'm telling you by practicing medicine more creatively you and your patients will be happier and we need we need the physician patient relationship back again we need that strength we need it to be strong. We need it to be a trusting relationship the way it used to be. We're going to talk about that too. Okay, so who am I? This is my story. I used to be the right-hand man of a very respected chief medical um, officer, director, for about, I don't know, over 10 years. And this man was is absolutely brilliant. And he would take care of the intel intellectually challenged people. And there was a lot of these people um, on Long Island. If you haven't guessed already from my accent, I am from Long Island. And it was only him and one other person doing it. And he has a heart of gold, but he had no power. And I would see him go to all of these facilities. He was the medical director about about eight of them on the island. And he had no power. Everybody, the administrators would just tell him what to write on the patient script. Like, why is the administrator saying that, you know, patient X needs an increase in physical therapy? I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, it's the doctor's, in my opinion, say. So after seeing this go on and on and on, I just changed my focus and I got my master's degree in healthcare administration. I, had, I already had my, uh, my master's in psychology, which by the way, plays into the healthcare world because I mean, it's all about emotions, right? The healthcare world, the, from the patients to the doctors, there's a lot of emotions that go on if you think about it. So it does help. I got employed um, after I got my master's, I got employed in this insurance company. And again, I saw how the doctors had no power and the administrators or the CEOs were telling the doctors what to do. And telling the doctors who needs a referral and that they won't, um, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to give that person in a, um, a CAT scan. They're not going to approve it. It was, it was absolutely disgusting. I couldn't believe what I was seeing for all those years. So I just had this passion. So I started from the bottom and I worked my way up. I definitely took a pay cut because I believed in the medical degree. I do think of myself as a physician advocate and I do really find the doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners, just everybody, even the EMP, EMTs, these people, it's so admirable that they want to help people. I could never personally be a doctor myself. I'm way too squeamish. I get like skeeved out by things. So I really want to help doctors help their patients. And that that's just my calling. And I was determined to put the power back in the doctor's hands and help them with it and help their patients. I'm not 
I wasn't the same as the other administrators. Um, they're not bad people. We just think differently. It's just a different beliefs. I knew I was different and I don't, again, believe in dictating practicing medicine to a physician or a nurse or anybody else. I did not go to medical school. I went to, you know, college for other reasons, but I do believe in working with the doctor. I believe it very strongly. And I wanted this role to help the doctors get the money they deserve because I saw how they were throwing the money out the window on the Medicare Advantage side, and they were doing things that they weren't getting, they weren't getting paid to do. So I showed them how to keep their hard-earned money in their pockets. You know, they work long hours. Again, I'm an advocate, so I don't have ill feelings towards physicians. Um, but they do work hard, and they work long hours, and they deserve to at least get <laughs> at least get paid for what they are doing anyway. So I build credibility with them and I build trust and I build a nice network of physicians that I respect very much. So that's me. That's who I am. That's my beliefs. That's what those are my that's my drive in this field. So what do you want most? Because this webinar is about you and uh, I think you want to understand macro and you will learn to implement the process into your practice or organization. It's already started because you bought this webinar. So congratulations for that. And you want to feel confident in your macro strategy. And that's exactly what this webinar is about. Why? Why do you want all those things? Because you want macro success in 2017. And beyond, you want to avoid the negative 4% penalty because those penalties are just going to go up as the years go on. And you want to make more money taking care of patients. And most of all, my audience always wants certainty for some reason. And this is my psych background, but people want certainty in their, they don't think that they can make the right decisions for themselves, which again, I just don't understand. So when you give them certainty, then they see it, then they, then they believe it. They, they, I don't know. It's like magic. They just get this confidence when they, you know, when they feel this certainty. So everybody just wants certainty. So how can you, how can you prepare yourself and your staff? Developing an understanding of just how big macro is, and it's not the monster you all fear it to be. It is not, it is not what everybody is saying it is. Macro is not trying to fit a, a, a square peg into a round hole. And I think that's what's going on is that, um, I just saw the, I wrote hole, W-H-O-L-E. Um, that's the problem. That's what I think is going on. It's the mentality of, oh, well, I'm just going to tweak my practice here and there to, you know, fit macro into it. No, that is not going to work. That is not going to, that may, that may work in 2017, but let me tell you something. When 2018 comes, that will not work. Macro is a big change in the health, in healthcare history. And you have to, you're going to need different tools. You're going to need different staff or the staff is going to have to take on additional responsibilities or, you're going to have to hire people. You're going to have to upgrade your EMRs. There's, it, it's a completely different playing field, but there's a lot more money and opportunity to be made here. So it's an investment in yourself, in your practice, in your patients. Uh, you'll probably be able to retire early when you see the money that you could be making. It's going to be worth your while. It's going to be worth your while, but you cannot do what you used to do. And you can't just say, oh, I'm just going to tweak it here and there. No, that's absolutely not. This is a na this is a national competition, which means everybody's competing against each other. And you know what? You're going to need to watch your performance constantly. And I know that sounds crazy. And it's like, oh, I don't know what I'm talking about. No, I know exactly what I'm talking about because I'm a ministry. I'm doing it. I'm doing I'm helping people. And like how they would watch their rap scores, you're going to have to watch your performance because there's always going to be somebody in the lowest and I don't want it to be you. It's a national competition. This is it should be taken very serious and that's why you have to get the right tools in place in your practice. You can't just keep doing what you're doing. 
But I have all that. I have all that. I've thought of it already for you. You just have to listen and keep that mind open. Okay. So the introduction to macro readiness. This webinar is focused on preparing for macro in ways nobody else is talking about. And like I said, you will need the education to understand the law. And you will need to seek out the certain resources and make investments in some tools. But you need this webinar first. Because if you don't understand just how big macro is, and if you don't just have that shift in mindset, the educational webinars are always going to be over your head. And you're not stupid. There's, there's no way that it's you. It's, it's too much information in an hour. I've given them... And I feel very frustrated for my audience because they they don't understand it and I've watered it down. And the reason why I made this webinar was because they're not they don't understand the concept of macro yet before the education. Watch, you're gonna have an aha moment. Watch, this is my whole point of doing this. And that's why it's so important for everybody to shift their mindsets. Because again, this is a completely different healthcare environment. And Everybody has to shift their mindset, not just the physician, the nurse, the nurse practitioners, the office managers, the physician assistants, everybody involved has to shift their mindset. I had to shift my, my mindset. I had to shift my mindset too. Everybody has to. It's already changed. If you look around, the nurse helps the doctor, and now the, the nurse is in control of his or her own scores. Again, it's a national competition. Excuse me, I keep saying it because it's really true. The same goes for the rest of the clinicians I just mentioned. Everybody's going to be in this. And all of the private insurances follow whatever Medicare does. Already 25% have their money in value-based care. In 2016. So before you can even shift your mindset, you have to be willing to, and let go of all those traditional medical practice, all the all that old logic. And I want everybody to just envision all the possibilities of what practice in medicine will look like. And then that's when you develop a sound business strategy to get the money you want. Not before this webinar. So I keep talking about how big it is. Well, how big is it? How big is macro? Well, it's a it's an evolution. It is a total revamping of the healthcare system as we know it. It's a total revamping of how you practice medicine. It's revamping how you will be getting reimbursed. There are huge rewards. There's huge money in this. But to be successful and to get the money you are going to need, teams of people to be on board. It's a team effort. It's not, oh, you know, the receptionist answers the phone and I, I'm in charge of coding. No, it's a team effort, and I'm going to show you why. MACRA is. It's, it's a tsunami that hit the healthcare industry in America, and it, it's, it just leveled it out. We're starting over. We're starting from scratch. And it affects everybody. CEOs. Everybody. It just it affects every single person in healthcare. A total restructuring now needs to take place on every single level. Some may look at this terrible. How can we rebuild? Where do you start? Others look at this as an opportunity. I look at it as an opportunity. I had a whole different business before this business. I just changed my whole entire business in 18 months to help you do this. It's my pleasure. It's who I am. It's what I love to do. But it's an opportunity to practice medicine differently, more creatively. Fix what is broken and has been for such a long time. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, it's, it's, there's been so many barriers between the patient and the doctor relationship. And I'm going to say clinician now because it is all about, it's the clinicians, it's not just the physicians. And I mean, in my opinion, the barriers were all well, the insurance companies that got involved and basically took the money right out of the doctor's hands, to be honest with you. Um, and it just made barriers now between the doctor and the patient. And it's all about the patient. And that's why you became doctors in the first place. And I'm going to get into that in a minute. But you go to the emergency room and you wait. 
but you're the patient and it's an emergency, but you're waiting on the doctor. That all has to change. That all has to change. It's all going to change. Your scores are going to depend on it. And again, your physicians and clinicians for a reason, because you actually want, it's like, it's going back. It's like going backwards. And I want to show you how, watch. Okay. Uh, doctors are burnt out. The statistics show that suicide rate is up. I was shocked to see this because they're not, they're not doctors anymore. They're just being dictated to by uh, other administrators and, you know, CEOs and insurance companies. And they're not, they're not doctors anymore. So I, I'd be upset too. And the patients are disgusted because the costs are rising so much and they're demanding more and more from their physicians and the physicians just need the resources to do it. MACRA is so big that it changes all of this. It changes all of this. It strengthens the physician-patient relationship. It breaks down all of the barriers so that it's a win-win for both physician and patient, just like in the old days. And I'm going to show you how. So here is the history of the physician. I did a lot of research on this. And in the beginning, I don't know, in the 19, early 1900s, 19... Yeah, 1900s, doctors had very little education, and some of them actually believed that they had special powers to help the patients, so that's where the whole quack doctors came out, but um, yeah, all this stuff came out. If you remember, going back, look, scotch, scotch toothpaste, oh my god, are you kidding me? How can you do that now? Um... Oral polio, uh, polio vaccine tastes good, works fast, prevents polio. That's hysterical. So anyway, um, they had very little education, but they knew that in America they had to get more education and they were smart people and they wanted the education. And they saw how Europe, um, the doctors, you know, they were, they got educated and they had this status and they said, well, you know, we want the status too. So I'm leaving on this slide so you could just look at the, the cool, um, th those are real. These are all real advertisements. So doctors wanted more education and they got it and they would make house calls and they would use the tools that were on their backs, whatever they can carry to get on the horse. And then or on the horse and buggy, which wasn't a lot of tools, by the way. And then they would treat the patient in the home. And they wouldn't just treat the patient. They would treat the patient and they would treat the patient's family as well. They knew each other. And they never even got paid. They got paid in goods because the people didn't have any money to pay the doctor. But that's the doctor cared so much that he took the good. He traveled a lot of far distances, like very far distances to get to each patient. And again, he didn't have much resources to do it. But Essentially, he was like a small time, you know, entrepreneur. And they agreed on whatever the goods were and the patient got treated and the doctor was paid and that was it. And it was a win win. I'm sorry. Doctors even did surgeries in the house. There was no hospitals. Doctors, they did. They did the surgeries in the house. And I, I, sh I saw the tool and I don't even I just don't even want to get into it. It was, of course, you know, on the pain level of the patient, but there absolutely was surgeries done in the house. Um, and then the Millis Commission and the, in the, because again, at this time, now the doctors are getting more educated, more educated. And these reports came out and it was basically everything I'm saying now. It was just the, the patient physician relationship. They were in three documents. And then as the doctors got their status because they got a little more education, you know, they, the first hospital was built and then for the poor, the government built the first hospital. And by the way, at this time, the government was not involved in medicine. The government uh, left it up to the states and the states didn't really do anything with it. So now the hospital's built and the doctor says, well, you know what? I think I want to, you know, I want my patients to come to me because I'm tired of driving all over the place, not even driving. We know how they were doing it. And they can come to me under one roof and I will see them in the hospital. And the patients love this idea because they're like, oh my God, this is so cool. This is the newest, like, this is the newest, like, trend and it's more precise going to the hospital for, to see the doctor instead of the doctor coming to see me. 
And this was before antiseptics came out. And that's what happened in the hospital. And then when this started to really, you know, there was lines of people waiting to see their physicians in the hospital. Sounds a little familiar. And um, referring back to my ER example. And that's when, oh, the insurance company says, well, hey, wait a second. I want a piece of this. I the uh, the patients can't really afford this, so I'm going to give them, you know, I'm going to give them some money, and then, you know, I think maybe, um, Mr. Doctor, you're, you know, you're worth this much money, and and I'll, you know, I'll see your patients, and obviously, the more patients you see, I will, you know, front the bill, but I want a cut out of it. So there goes the doctor just became an entrepreneur and was just going to be successful, and there goes his money. And then there goes the relationship between the doctors and the patients, in my opinion, at that point, because and this is about, what, 1930s I'm, I'm up to? Because now the insurance company's involved. And now for the doctor to make a lot of money, he has to see volume of patients. And then more and more, more and more regulations as the doctors got more and more educated. And then they had to get more certifications. And now they have to keep up on their certifications. More and more schools came out. Med schools came out more and more regulations to get into the med schools and then capitation comes creeping in again paying for the volume of patients you see a day and then all the end out of pocket expenses you know the visit was rising and then the drug companies came in and now they're you know they're giving doctors vacations for them to you know write write their prescriptions for the drugs that they want to sell and then they had to put regulations on that because the pharmaceutical companies were giving doctors like cars and these like massive gifts that again going back to he was paid on goods that's not allowed anymore because why because the insurance company's involved because the government's involved and then technology was coming through with all this and you know of course coming up the pike technology is always changing and let's just fast forward for the sake of time to now where are our physicians where are the doctors practicing they're all employees. They're employees of hospitals now. One in three doctors are employees in hospitals because they can't keep up with the costs of keeping their practice, you know, their private practice anymore. And again, there goes their little entrepreneurship. So now they have a boss. Now they have a boss again. And again, in my opinion, this was not, this was not where Look, there was supposed to be a, there was supposed to be entrepreneurs, which of course I am myself, so I feel bad. And they are, they're innovative thinkers, and they are super smart. And no, nope, now they work, now they work in the now they work for the hospitals, and now they have a boss again, just like how they had the boss with the insurance companies. I, I don't even know how many bosses physicians have and clinicians have at this point, because if you're an ACO, they have to do their thing, and then if you're, you know, again in a hospital, you have all those other things, you have all those regulations, and then you could be a more than one ACO, and it. All depends on where money's tied up. So there's your stats, the one in three doctors. And this sounds very familiar. But here's the shift. Here comes the shift. So we saw where we were, and you heard what I said before. Let's just see where we're going. Let's just see where, where the future is going to take us. So I put this little exercise together because I just want you to shift your mindset. So forget about macro. Forget about being a hospital employee. And just look at your practice now and tell me what you like about it. Tell me what you don't like about it. What is working for you? In your perfect world, what would your practice look like? What would your practice? What would your what, would you would you practice in an office or over the computer? Telemedicine is huge. Again, technology always helps us. Who would be on your team? What is the HR <laughs> electronic health record of your dreams? I'm laughing at myself. What capabilities would it have? What hours would you work? What would you charge the insurance company for an office visit? Would you like to make house calls or use telemedicine or both? Or you'd love to be a hospital employee? And again, I'm not knocking it. I'm just bringing something to your attention. I'm just making a point. Most importantly, 
What is the relationship with your patients? Do you feel a disconnect? Or do you feel close to them? It's all just for you to think about. I'm asking you these questions to get you to think about what you want for yourself and for your patients. I'm showing you that you that the power is back in your hands. Not CMS, not the CEO of the hospital, not the health plan, not the ACO, not the MSO. The power is in your hands. You're the healer. When was the last time you heard somebody say that? So what are, what are you doing right now? You're shifting your mindset to the many possibilities of different ways to practice medicine. Once you have the answers to those questions on those two slides, you're ready to talk about macro. Let's look at it. Again, it's a total revamping of the healthcare system. It's a total revamping of how you practice medicine. It's revamping how you will be getting reimbursed. There are huge rewards. There is big money in it. But to be successful and get the money you are going to need, teams of people, an all hands on deck approach. Anyone who's not interested in your team, I'm telling you right now, get rid of because you're wasting your money on their salary and they're not serving you. So you can use that money and invest in macro. Get rid of all the dead weight. Again, these are all the old mindsets. If they can't, if, they, if they're not willing to shift it, they're not serving you. You're, you're wasting your money, and they're going to work against you. Your role has changed by practicing medicine differently, so your staff's roles are going to need to change. Your entire team has to adopt a different mindset for this to work. I feel like I should like be in your office and 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 say this to everybody. Everybody should be on this webinar. But your entire team has my guidance and support. Things are going to change drastically and fast. You need to you need to change in order to be in it. Macra has many programs impacting every level within your organization. And most importantly, it's the patients. It's impacting the patients' lives. The patients will help you succeed in macro. You are going to need your patients. And here goes your patient's cooperation. And here goes the physician or clinician patient relationship. It's going to have to change. But again, this is why you guys want to be physicians, this is why you, you, you want to help people. So I feel like all the physicians that I hear on a daily basis all day long that they're upset with macro, I don't I, I, I have a hard time understanding it because it's like you should be so thrilled with macro. You now have a stronger relationship with your patient. You're going to get paid more money. You're going to be paid so much more money. This is a win win for you guys. It, it's nobody wants to shift their mindset. Nobody wants to change. And I understand. Again, I'm, I have a psych background. I understand. It's it's it's, a, it's 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 change is scary. Trust me. Anybody knows me. You know, I'm not Mrs. Change, but you have to, you know, I chose healthcare for a reason. I have to ride it. I have to ride it like a, like a motorcycle. It's, you have to be flexible is what I'm trying to say. But it, it's, it's the relationship with your patients. You just got back and you're going to get paid way more money to do it. Patient engagement is at the center of macro success. You're going to have to empower your patients in ways that you have not done before. It's the patients. The patient is now going to be making the decisions with you because, again, this is a team effort. This is a joint effort. This is. This is uh, it, it's a completely different. Way to practice medicine and why, why? Why do you need to empower your patients? Number one, I'm sure you want to. You know, it's not that you don't want to. It's they don't want to do it. And I totally get it. But patient engagement applies to all of the programs in MACRA. It's in the merit-based incentive system, MIPS. It's in the accountable care organizations. The bundled payments, the medical homes. We're going to talk about all that. That's, those are all advanced alternative payment models. That is the future of... Healthcare is these alternative payment models. That's the education that you got before you got this webinar. I, ho I hope this is making sense. The most basic mandatory patient engagement requirements are 
patient education, patient electronic, they want access to the, to the health records, the health information, and secure messaging. They want to be able to talk to you, you know, when they want. Again, they have higher costs, and this is a team effort. So it's like the doctor in the house, the house call doctor. You guys, are, you know, it's going back to that. These are important because they serve as great opportunities to improve your organization's performance across virtually every macro domain. So you're helping your patients and you're also helping yourself. Because again, win-win, not just one-sided. These specific patient engagement measures exist in macro because there is evidence that they improve clinical and financial outcomes. Do not treat these as meaningless criteria. Treat this as the backbone to your success. Because you're going to, if you took the education before, I'm sure you have, there's all these improvement activities and some of the measures, if you want to pick, they're weighted higher in macro and in MIPS because it's all about, you know, patient satisfaction and patient engagement. You're going to also need to foster the physician-patient relationship, just like, like I just said, like the old intention of becoming a doctor or medical professional. Remove the batteries. And I will show you how to do this during this webinar. Building trust is key. Building trust was key between it's between me and my clients. Physician-patient relationship. The patients of today have a very different mindset than before for a number of reasons. Primary reason is cost. But they're paying astronomically high prices on a monthly basis, so it's only natural that they will become more demanding of your time. And here's what they want. I'm a patient. They want 24-7 access to you and their health information. They want to communicate with their provider without having to make an in-person appointment. They want more convenient ways to schedule appointments and pay their bills. They want tools that empower them to participate, and they want educational resources. You have all these things in your office. Everybody texts everybody now. Just be, you know, be comfortable with it. Delivering all of these tools to your patients just happens to be, like I said, in, in the improvement activities and MIPS, you will earn MIPS points to your CPS score all by giving your patients what they want. In addition, these tools will improve your patient satisfaction score, something that will be very important to you as a clinician because it's going to drive more business to your practice. Again, win-win for both, excuse me, <clears throat> and it's a building a trusting relationship. Invest in the tools that can improve patient compliance, automated reminders, connected devices that make self-maintenance more convenient, better education so patients know what they can do to improve their health and what the consequence is of not doing so. The insurance companies are already caught on to this, so you know what they're doing? They're sending, they're sending me, I have a two-year-old, they're sending me $25 if I get all of her um, wellness checks in a certain amount of time. If I do all the wellness checks, they're going to give me money. So they're going to give me money for, you know, being a good parent anyway. Why would I not give my daughter all the wellness checks? Of course I will. I want to be healthy, but that's, that's my mentality. You know, the, you know, somebody else maybe doesn't have the time, but doesn't have the car to get there. I don't know, but they're also doing that with my parents. Obviously they're seniors and they're getting $25 from their insurance companies, which obviously is Medicare because they're seniors, um, to get their colonoscopies and to get their mammograms. And so they're already catching on. They're already incentivizing patients to stay healthy. What they're going to do with the unhealthy ones is a whole nother story. They're probably going to start penalizing them. Um, all right. So let's just talk about some ways to engage your patients. Total shift in mindset. When practicing medicine. So shift it towards that dreaded, let's just take the EMR as an example. So your technology needs to be visually educating in an interactive way and informative way now. It's the primary use of the EMR. So when you come in and you see your patient after the medical assistant leaves, you have your face in the computer because you need to check off all the boxes and write everything down. I know exactly what goes into a note. 
I've educated my physicians on it. Um, so I understand the time that it takes and you have to do this in order to get paid even a little bit from the insurance company. Well, so you have to, you have to document the note to begin with, right? So why don't you, um, explain to the phys- explain to the patient, make it like a teaching session. By the way, CMS is now going to pay you, if you use certain codes, which I have, um, the longer you pay, <laughs> the longer you stay with your patient at the visit is the more money you get. So again, where are we going with this? So if you turn, if you turn your office visit into a mini learning session, you're going to engage your patient and the patient's going to be happy when he, he or she sees, you know, that his blood pressure is up or down and he's going to, he's going to, he's going to see that, that you care to teach him what's going on. And again, you have to write the note anyway, and it's, it, it will engage him. I'm telling you, you're going to see how making the patient part of the pro- process is going to help him to take care more better care of himself. And you as a clinician will feel good because you're teaching and you're helping your patient. I just made this example that you get a Chromebook because they're cheaper than the iPads. And I don't care, project it onto the wall. Be creative. Have the have the MA set it up before you walk in. They can have more responsibility. This will build a trusting relationship. You'll be happy that you taught your patient. You won't be burnt out. And you're and you're gonna see your patients finally doing what you've been wanting them to do to begin with. I'm telling you, engage your patients. They will take their health more serious. So I developed a concept called feel-good medicine. And I've created this concept because I understand just how important the physician-patient relationship is and not just the physician, again, clinician. And I I, want to break down those barriers. I want to continue to break down those barriers. So this is my concept of feel-good medicine. Any relationship is a two-way street, right? So like I said before, the practice of medicine is very emotional and people remember how you made them feel. That's just, it's, it's just the way it is. You remember how somebody makes you feel. So I thought to myself and I said, well, what if, what if you and your staff can increase the patient experience at the time of the visit? And the patient went home and handwritten a note to you, thanking him for taking care of him or his family member. The family member wrote, thank you for taking care of my dad. How would that make you feel reading the note? When was the last time you got a thank you from your patients? I don't know. Maybe you get them every day. I hope you do. If you don't, think about it. How would that make you feel? And how would your patient feel? If they received a handwritten praise letter or praise note from you, the clinician congratulating him or her on his blood pressure coming down or losing the the weight he needed to lose or she needed to lose, the patient would feel pretty special. I'm telling you, they would think, wow, my doctor or my nurse, my clinician really cares about me. (coughs) Excuse me. And I know that you do. And you know that you care, but does the patient know? That's why I asked you before in that exercise, what is your relationship with your patients right now? Some good, some bad, all great. What's the relationship? It's a simple thing if you just stop and send a letter. And then you're happy that your patient is, you know, you're you're, you're your patient's biggest cheerleader. It's just something simple. It doesn't take a lot of time that would go a long way, I feel. Feel good medicine, I'm telling you. It's just a simple way to show you care about your patient and vice versa. Taking the time to praise or thank another person for their job well done. Not to keep going back to my psych degree, but there are three motivators that, you know, get people to do things. One is money, two is food, (laughs) and three is praise. So. Those aren't my rules. That's, that's, Freud came out with it. So 
I just bet their experience would just bring you back to why you became a medical profession professional before. And maybe just try it. Say, let me see if Tina's right. Let me just try it. See what happens. And when you're developing a macro strategy, think about the following. Think, think about, do you want to be an independent entrepreneur or do you want to have a boss? It, 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 everybody's on their own paths. I just want you to know that you have options, you have choices. How much money can you afford to invest in the resources and tools needed for macro inflammation? That's completely spelled wrong, and I'm sorry. How much are you willing to invest? How much are you willing to invest? People have money for what they want to have money for. When revamping your practice or healthcare organization, think about how you can restructure your current staff. For you, for MAPA to work, you, you ideally you will need a point person f focusing on the reporting because the reporting requirements are a lot. It, it's basically a big, huge piece of it. So there's going to need to be a point person, or if you're an organization, you're probably going to have to, you probably need a department over it, over the reporting. And your entire staff is going to have to be aware of population health. That's those people with the multiple chronic conditions, the diabetes and the COPD, um, oh God, the ESRD people, um, just they, everybody, everybody has multiple chronic, the people are sick and they play a huge part macro because they, they're about 86% of the, of, um, of the health, of healthcare costs and it has to, it, it, the, they have to come down. These people have to care about themselves. So you're going to need one point person to focus on managing and tracking their appointments and make, and keeping track of, of their preventative measures, these chronic condition people. And not just one person. You should have your whole staff should be aware of all the people who have chronic conditions. I mean, you're not even going to believe this, but Uber is now contracting with healthcare organizations. Well, why do you think that is? Because they're finding out, the statistics are showing that these chronic, these multiple chronic care people, these really sick patients, they can't get to the doctor's appointments or they don't care about going to the doctor. So they just go to the ER when something goes wrong. And then the ER visit is way more expensive than taking, driving Uber, sending Uber over and paying for it. That, this is what we're, this is what we're looking at. It is, <laughs> this is how huge this is. You you may you may need to contract with Uber and get you and I and I I suggest you do because you need, you're gonna need to see your patients. Well, get in your car and go see them in the house. I'll find if there's a code for it or telemedicine. Use a telemedicine. It's a completely different playing field. So see what you can use your current staff. I know you guys are a team and you guys are used to working together. I'm not trying to break that up. But I just want everybody's attitude to be in the right place. I just want their head to be, just mind to be open. It's not the same job you used to you used to have. Mine isn't either, and I wasn't happy about it either. I would stay at this. the The proposed law was way, way stricter than than the final final rule in macro. You got everybody's heads would have been spinning right now about the proposed rule. They were very lenient because they want this to work. And one of the goals of MACRA is to improve the beneficiary outcomes and enhance clinician experience. It's one of the goals. So when you're developing your MACRA strategy, also think about partnering with urgent care centers for the following reasons. Again, I thought of this already. They have convenient hours and locations and more opportunities for patient engagement, sharing clinical data, analytical tools to provide deeper insights into a patient's behavior and medication adherence. They can help you. They can help you improve your patient outcomes. Think about all the benefits of collaborating with such centers. Again, there's opportunities with MACRA. Think of them. Just I'm just trying to get the wheels turning. Considered an upgrade to the EMR system to be cert certified 2015. I already have 
questionnaires available for you just to ask your vendor. I already have the questions you need to ask them to make sure you're not paying for crap. I did all this for you. I even have EMR people on standby waiting to take your call. That's how much research I've done for you. I'm giving this to you. I'm trying to help you the best way I can, but you got to meet me halfway. So I have the list of questions to ask your EMR. You don't even have to think about it. I, ha I have EMRs waiting. Just, just look at the free demos. Get your hands on that quality research use, uh, use report. You've got to get your hands on that. And it, there's, it's a huge rigmarole on how to get the report because, again, you know, it's not gonna be, <laughs> CMS isn't going to make it easy for you. But I did. I have all the directions right now for you. I give them out to everybody all the time. And the reason why you want that report is because it's going to show you how much how much your episodes in care are costing CMS. And you want to be aware of where you're, you know, where you're costing them a lot, where your patients are costing them a lot, and think of ways to bring that down. Creative medicine. Feel-good medicine. The QUR report will also show you which measures you're good at and which measures you need improvement on. So it shows you the cost and it shows you the quality. It's a very useful tool. Comes out, it came out in uh, the fall, 2006, 16, obviously. Okay, this report also shares feedback with you on how CMS evaluates you on the value-based modifier and the PQRS uh, performance. The cost performance category will increasingly, increasingly become more and more important. Grow to be, it's going to grow to be worth 30% in the MIPS CPS score. So cost means nothing now in 2017, as everybody saw in their educational webinars, but the bar is going to continue, you know, CMS is going to raise the bar. And CMS just finalized 10 episode specific measures and developed a new set of codes that track spending back to the clinician in 2018. 2018, I'm telling you that the hammer is coming down and you're just going to have to wrap your head around it, which is why I'm trying to help you start from the beginning and take a deep breath and just move very flexibly through. I'll hold your hand through it. It's my whole purpose of doing this. The new episode codes are patient coordination and patient relationship. There's even more codes since I wrote this webinar. I have them. Take a hard look at your financials, you, not the office manager, because you want to know where your money is, what percentages are tied up in an outpatient surgical center or a nursing home or an ACL, et cetera. Whatever organi organizations you do business with, you got to know where, where your money is, where the percentages are. It's not the office manager's money, it's your money. Yes, in essence, if you have to close up shop and you don't do well, the office manager will be out of a job. I've been seeing that a lot, too. My friends have been losing their jobs left and right because the hospital will then employ, you know, their own staff and your office manager will be out of it. So, yeah, that person needs to take this very serious. Where are your patients? What percentages of your patients are seen in other facilities? So know where, the, where, where your money is and where the patients are. And are you facing penalties for not reporting for PQRS? You need to know these things in order to develop an effective strategy. Education source. Macro is continuing to evolve with many changes being made daily. How are you going to stay on top of all the changes? I just said there's new codes that came out just this week. There's new advanced alternative payment models that just came out. Five. Five new ones just came out. It's not even January, 2000, January 1st, 2017 yet. Who are you going to turn to for all this most accurate, up-to-date information? Me. I have it. And finally, all organizations have strengths and weaknesses. Weaknesses. How does your organization align with the value-based future? All things for you to think about. This is your future. Give you, you deserve to think about it. So now that you're aware of how huge macro is and why it's so important to understand that a change in mindset is necessary when looking at macro, at the future of macro, 
without that understanding first, all educational seminars and webinars would will, will continue to go over your head. Not because you're stupid, but because of the traditional trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. Spelt it right there. Um, it's not going to work with macro to get the money you want. It's not. I wish I could tell you different. I'm not here to lie to you. I'm telling you the serious, hard on truth. It's only now that you can begin to absorb the education piece of macro. Trust me, the information will not be nowhere near so overwhelming because you have a deeper understanding of macro's vastness and have adopted a new mindset. Now you would go and strategize. Now you would go and strategize. And then take educational webinars. I have plenty of them. Take, take them. But you needed this one first. Do you see why you needed this one first? I will give you the value based key, the case to the value based kingdom. The services I offer are assessments, issues and solutions, specialty codes, macro webinars, in office training, and ebooks. I did all this for you. You know how much work that was? I did assessments so you can uncover every single area where your practice is currently out of compliance. I did issues and solutions so you can feel confident in your macro strategy as you busy strategizing. Many questions do come up and you will need answers in order to finish the strategy. That's why I made that one, this one service because it was, it's, it's layer on top of layer and every practice or organization has different questions. So I wanted that to be made available to you in office training so you can understand the rules and regulations. Remember, it's a team approach. Macro webinars, so you can continue to learn about macro and your specialty practice. Macro is, again, almost 2,400 pages. I break the overview of macro into a series of chunks so the information can be absorbed. It's not all, all at once. And I don't want you leaving my webinars with your head spinning or feeling stupid. That's not, I want you leaving my webinars with a sense of confidence and calmness that, all right, I, I, I could do this. Tina will show me how. I have ebooks so you can immediately download education information and use it as a reference. This is investments in you. I only had time today to talk about the number one thing in macro readiness, which was just how big it is, the opportunities it has, and to just shift your mindset. I created all of these other tools to get the education to you as fast as possible, all at different price points, so you understand that I want to help you achieve macro success. And by the way, all my prices, they're all on my website. There's, there's no secrets here. So, for example, the assessment is $1,200. Okay, so let's just say that you make $60,000 a month in macro. I'm sorry, macro. What am I talking about? <laughs> Medicaid. It the assessment's only twelve hundred dollars, right? So that's twenty four hundred dollars that I'm saving you on the penalty because I just did an assessment on your practice, right? So you're gonna yes, you're gonna pay me. But for every dollar you spend, you're going to make a huge return on investment. I mean, as I'm thinking about it, maybe maybe my maybe my assessment should be higher. I know all the consultants that charge five grand for an assessment. That's not what I'm here for. I'm here to help you get the education at a good price, a fair price. So if you think about it, $1,200, that's less than 10% of the penalties that you'll be avoiding. Just by getting your practice set up properly. So for every dollar you pay me, you'll be keeping at least $10 in your own pocket. And that's only if you're the average Medicare, you only make like 60 grand. If you're above average, your return's even higher. So that's just the assessment. It gets all on my website. I made it very convenient for everybody to just pay and let's just get this done. You cannot afford to put this off. 
All right, so let's think about it. Let's think about, let's take the assessment again. This is why you can't afford to take, to put it off. Hold on, I'm doing the math. I'm doing the math right now, hold on. All right, so let's just take the 60,000 for the first year and penalties is 4%. So that's 2,400 per month that you won't get. $2,400 per month. That's $2,880. $2,800. Per year, you won't get per year $28,000 for, for a $1,200 assessment. You see where I'm going with this? Can't afford to put it off. You don't want that penalty. And I don't even want you to avoid the penalty. I want to help you avoid the penalty and make more money. And drive, pra drive patients to your practice. Contact me to schedule assessment right now, not tomorrow, not next week. Contact me now and let's get your practice set up. I don't want it to be too late. Don't call me tomorrow or next week only to find that my schedule is packed because it is. I literally work seven days a week, but I do this for you. I do this because I really believe in your success and I believe you can do this. So let's just, let's just get it done. My schedule is already packed. I, I, I'm already behind today. I don't care. I will squeeze you in I because I appreciate people jumping on things and taking a proactive approach. I appreciate that. I'm going to reward you for that. That's why it's only $1,200. If you want to wait until 2017 and I have room in my schedule, the prices will go up because it's, gonna, it's, just, it's just the way it's going to be. So go to my website, macroconsultant.com, and let's, let's do this. Let's get macro money. Thank you for attending. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it.